and welcome to the second day of uh, this uh, conference. Uh, there's quite a bit of speaking with Poma all over the world, so we're very excited to uh, to be here again in London. I was here last last uh, month or two ago for Excel. So there's, so there's a heart surgeon that uh, took his car to his local garage for a regular service. And uh, the mechanic says, so, so tell me, talking to the surgeon, you know, I've been wondering why you get paid so much more than I when essentially we do the same thing. And the surgeon says, oh, you think so, huh? The mechanic says, yeah, matter of fact, I mean, basically, you know, do the same thing. I work on a complicated engine, and I open it up, uh, fix the valves, and put it all together and make sure that it's working properly, and it's good as new. We essentially do the same thing, right? And yet you get paid 10 times more than I. How do you explain that? So the surgeon thought for a moment and replied, try with the engine running. Exactly, if you work on your cars, you know what that is. Well, today I want to talk to you about perspectives. Some cities may believe that they have a smart city plan in place that is holistic, and that perhaps maybe even provides valuable new services to citizens. But is that really the case? What I want to share with you today is a practical guide. So for some of you that attended yesterday's panel, I talked a little more on the technology and data analytics side. But today I'm gonna to actually stay away from technology and talk about some of the actual case studies that I've seen as well as some of the best practices and a methodology that I'm going to share with you today that hopefully is actionable. The Smart City Initiative has to take into account the uniqueness of a city or region. And the reality is, of course, no two cities are going to be identical, right? And of course, there are best practices that can be shared across, but the mission, the purpose of the Smart City has to be unique to that environment. Now, I visited Dubai, Singapore, Seoul, and of course London, and many other places, and know many smart city initiatives around the globe. And what I can tell you that it, everything from their geography to political climates, uh, their industries, tax revenue sources, to even the makeup, the composition of the citizens, and the needs that they have are vastly different. I mean, sure, we all need water, utilities, and gas, and public services, but one particular city may rely on desalination for generating drinkable water, whereas another city may have ample fresh water and underground rivers and ravines. So ultimately, your mission statement reflects your values and how your government entity looks to increase the quality of life for your citizens and visitors. Now, just last week, I uh, had a chance to speak with Denver, Colorado. They have a very interesting smart initiative going on. It's very interesting because it's only one major developer that's working in conjunction with the local government to create a sister city from the ground up. It's gonna be brand new. And they really wanna create it as a test bed to be able to bring in some of the most innovative sets of technologies that's available. Now, I tell you though, one of the concerns that they confided in me is that they don't want their smart city project to be hijacked by one of the big firms. Because part of the mission statement is to grow an open ecosystem that's comprised of startups, mid-sized, and large companies. And to have a competitive bid, and to make sure that they're not overlooking something that's innovative just because it's not one of the big companies. Well, so how do they, how do they go about this? Well, First, it starts with internal education, because how can you plan, operate a smart city initiative when your politicians, your bureaucrats, and your staff are not knowledgeable about smart cities, the Internet of Things, centralized security, or decentralized security for that matter, privacy, open data, and best practices, right? So it really requires, first, the education and the training component. And it requires then a vendor agnostic party who can then come into the city to help 
run and facilitate that RFI, RFP process in the most democratic fashion to allow for diversity in the types of vendors and solutions that gets brought into this environment. Yet, it still adheres to the best practices and the standards that's unified. And I'll talk about that unification in just a second. Now, part of that preparation is also self-assessment of the government itself when it comes to handling the security, the privacy, the open data, as well as the interoperability. Meaning, where are they in their current roadmap? And can they, in fact, actually sustainably support any of these things? Well, now if they don't have those frameworks and methodologies in place, the issue is going to be how do you effectively start to systematically measure and have safeguards in terms of whether it's actually working or not, and whether a smart city project has been implemented effectively, and that you're actually protecting your citizens. Because one of the things that we've been talking about and anticipate is as we accumulate experience on smart city projects, eventually in the next few years, we're going to start to, going to see some major security breaches. And we're not just talking about personal, identifiable information. Now, you talk to the big guys, and of course, we work, we partner with some of the big guys as well, the vendors. But they always tell you, when it comes to their IoT platform, that their solution is able to do just about everything. So, that means everything from data cleansing, data collection, data permissioning, data analytics, on the cloud, as well as perhaps even on the edge, and of course, security. So, even just last week, and I'm not going to mention names, but a very big firm with their big platform announced their massive platform called Impact. But if you actually look and drill down into the white paper and start to dig a little bit deeper in terms of even the security solution, let's say that is tailored for IoT, it's really still using traditional security protocols. So it's certificate and the kinds of centralized approach. But what happens in a smart city environment is there's a number of things that's very unique to the Internet of Things, such as playback attacks, meaning because it's not a computer type of a model where it's intermittent connection, but it's a continuous public subscribe model. So it's susceptible to playback attacks. The other piece that's a real concern that's specific to the nuances of the Internet of Things is this notion of multi hop So before that data packet actually arrives to that gateway to the cloud, it has to go through multiple nodes. And each of those nodes may be using different standards and protocols and completely different sets of security standards. So it's highly vulnerable. So the typical approach isn't going to cut it. Now here's a common problem that we see with uh, smart city initiatives. Uh, someone in political office will see that their sister city in another part of the world has just implemented a smart garbage can or a smart LED project, right? And they think that's a fantastic idea. Now, the problem with this approach is, unfortunately, this is not a plan, but rather an impulse. Now, one of the biggest problems that we're seeing in terms of smart city initiatives is that it's rarely organized in such a way that is cross-agency, cross-authority. So, someone at the top of the command says, we need to start a smart initiative. But by the time it cascades down to the various agencies, they're running these projects independently. Now, let me tell you exactly why this is a problem. Let's take the example of um, uh, a, a country that I recently visited that I'm not going to mention for the reason. But you have a transportation agency that's running it and holding different competitive projects and bids. And they have an entirely different staff. So that means that they have a certain vendor selection. They are using a certain communication network standards and protocol. They're handling security in one, one way, or in most cases, they're not handling security at all and relying on their vendor to actually manage it. And the question then becomes, how do you know that they actually manage it? Right? Then you have the Waterworks Agency that's actually working on a completely different stack entirely. I mean, and so on and so on. You get the picture, right? Well, what you end up is a potpourri of vendors, technologies, protocols, and standards that are not unified. And there's no verified way to know if, in fact, any of these things are adhering to any security policies, data policies, if there's any form of privacy checks and balances. Because as most of you that are in the EU um, area, you, there's you know, things like GDPR that's affecting your business. 
in compliance. Now, one of the things that's uh, really a problem is without this unified framework and the security standards and the audibility, the city, believe it or not, thinks that they're actually making these services available, including open data initiatives. But what they've actually done is expose themselves to unlimited liabilities. Because now their citizen data is vulnerable to attacks, right? And hacks. And we're not, again, just talking about PII data. What we're talking about is how much you paid on your property or parcel tax, your alimony payments, the amount of taxes that you owe to the government. I cannot emphasize the need for a holistic plan at the highest level that process, process agencies and authorities, right? Now, I recognize that's a tall order. I mean, we're talking about government after all, right? So how do you get these government agencies to collaborate, let alone share data? So it is a big challenge. But to have a holistic plan in place it really does require a cross-agency perspective. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about is this notion of roadmap. Um, many cities, you know, when they talk about Internet of Things and smart city projects, they're talking about the LED lights, the smart meters, the gar garbage cans, and the CCTV, computer vision, right? facial recognition, and so forth. But these are low-hanging fruits, right? And the reason they're pursuing these types of projects is because they have relatively low spend. And they're looking for quick wins. And frankly, what happens is that the big vendors actually support this. So if you talk to the G's, the IBM, the Cisco's, and the Microsoft and the Intel's, they actually keep their scope tight because that's, they know that the governments prefer to keep things low and tight. Now the problem with this approach is that it's certainly not unified, but it's also short-sighted. And let me explain. See, when, there, when vendors and governments alike uh, take on these small projects, like smart meters and show big ROI. And just keep in mind that when you have enough of anything, you're gonna always be able to justify large savings. But the real win for a smart city isn't always necessarily your utilities and water and the things that seems obvious, but it has to go back to the mission statement. Again, the mission statement being, how are you increasing the welfare and the happiness of your citizens, right? Because Sometimes it's not about the smart garbage cans. And I'll explain in just a second with an example of uh, tourism. So I, uh, I visited uh, China, and I've been to Beijing and Shanghai. And I'm also aware of a project that's happening between some of the Chinese government and some of the airports. And the reason is, there's a, there's a problem that they recognize. Tourism as a whole that's coming to China is a growing industry. It's a tax revenue industry. However, what's happening is, when you arrive, and if you've ever traveled uh, into that region, is you don't have Wi-Fi. And the reason for that is the telcos wants to make sure it's locked down. They don't want to give away anything for free. Of course, it's very costly. So cloud, if you're a cloud provider in that space, you know how fragmented that area is as well. So what happens is these tourists come to the airport, they have no Wi-Fi, and it's very difficult to get local information. And they go out to the airport, and they cannot conversate with any of the locals because many of the locals don't speak English. So what you have is a lot of friction. That translates into less spending, lower satisfaction, and ultimately lower revenue and referrals and recommendation. Now, again, they are actually addressing it. That's a great thing, or at least parts of it, at least the airport piece. But imagine if they took the smart city plan holistically and looked at it as an example, in this case, about tourist user journey. So the user journey from beginning to end, where are the friction points, and how can the smart city start to remove those inefficiencies, those frictions? What you have at the end of that process, if you have to do it properly, is you're gonna have very satisfied, happy tourists that's gonna spend a lot more money, and that's gonna generate a tremendous amount of tax revenue for that country. Another notion is this notion of product roadmap, like I mentioned. Uh, a smart city has to incorporate, of course, the low-hanging fruits, right, for quick, quick hits. But it also has to take into account mid-term as well as longer term. Because the reality is that the big gains that's gonna really make a difference in terms of the welfare of your citizens may take much longer and take much more money. So it requires planning it up. Now, of course, 
we recognize that the budget climate within some of these environments, these jurisdictions and domicile, may not allow for some of these bigger projects. But when you have a roadmap methodology in place, at least you start to put that into a systematic map and have a bigger picture. Now let's talk about the implementation stage. Now what many cities don't realize is that they're relying too heavily on vendors. A great project manager doesn't simply say, here's a project and hands it over entirely. But they have to first and foremost have competency and deep subject matter expertise and knowledge. Because they need to be able to orchestrate and to be able to guide that process from, from strategy to execution. Otherwise you're not gonna get the intended results, right? Another point that's really important is this notion of what happens when the project concludes. Well, what we've seen is that there's no support. Support immediately ends when the project dollars ceases. And what we've heard from local citizens of all over the world is uh, what's the point of having these data initiatives and open smart city initiatives when the project ends, the support stops. Now, I'll give you um, an example of this. I recently visited a, a certain region in the Middle East, and they had a complaint. They said, we have access to this open data, but when you actually look into it, it's actually not usable. And the reason it's not usable is because the government is missing a closed loop feedback cycle and the necessary ongoing support. So there is no mechanism to give feedback or have submission of change requests. So what you end up having is this data that's stale and old and not usable, and if you were to actually digest it and then data visualize it, you would be presenting garbage data. So we need to really think, rethink the entire budgeting and staffing model to ensure that there is this notion of ongoing support and the responsiveness to feedback as well as change requests. The last one I want to share is around this notion of measurements and KPIs. Now, when we talk about smart cities, we, of course, talk about all the big savings and efficiency and automation. Of course, these are relatively easy metrics. But let's go back to the mission statement. In the case of UAE, their mission statement is to increase people's happiness. They literally want to make Dubai the happiest place on Earth. So how, then how do you begin to actually start to even make that happen, let alone measure it, right? Because the traditional means of economic measurement isn't going to work. We need to look at different qualitative measures that gets into social values, right? So are they happier? And if so, how do you know? Are they living longer? Are they purchasing real estate in that area? Are they, are they, um, uh, 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 is there a higher tax compliance because there is a, a belief that the government is credible, trustworthy, consistent, for instance. So really thinking about moving away from the traditional economic model and thinking about social value and value exchange. Because after all, when we talk about smart city, it is a public good. So government is not a private enterprise. They are not subject to things like return on investment, shareholder value, and market capitalization. So we need to have a different way to measure beyond just tying it back to a balance sheet objective. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna end with this, um, this story. Oh, there we go, there it goes. A uh, story about uh, a Mexican fisherman. So American investment banker uh, visits a small Mexican fishing village and notices a, a fisherman fishing. And goes up to him and says, you know, how many hours do you actually spend on fishing? And he says, oh, just a few hours, just enough to survive and have plenty of time for my family and enjoy life. And the American asked him, well, why don't you work longer and catch more fish? And the uh, fisherman said, well, why would I want to do that? Well, because you're going to make more money. And how long would I have to do that for? Well, about 50, 20 years. And the fisherman says, and then what? Well, then we'll get boats, and then we'll go public, we'll go IPO, we'll become rich. The fisherman says, okay, then what? And the American finally says, well, you get to retire. You move to a small fishing village, fish a little, sleep a little bit, or sleep late, and play with your kids. Enjoy life. So the point is sometimes we think that doing the right thing means making things bigger, more efficient, scalable. And there are certainly cases for that in the smart city context. But let's remember that it's never about technology for the sake of technology. We need to understand first and foremost 
that we are trying to raise the happiness and welfare of our citizens. The Internet of Things and the smart city concept is not just about the what's and the how. So when I attend and speak at these conferences all over the world, we mostly talk about the how. The Internet of Things is not the end, it's a means, it's a set of tools. So we need to be first clear on the why. This goes back to the first point, which is a mission statement. Thank you.